I don't know if you got one for Christmas, but I'm sure that it would be the worst present of all, and that's a 2020 monthly calendar. Um, <laughs> Because that didn't work out the way you anticipated. I mean, that has been the, really the theme of these months, right? The uncertain, the unrest, the chaos. Um, and I know that everyone in our culture right now is scrambling to try and get back to normal, to be normal, to feel normal. And I'm just here to tell you this morning with the authority of God's Word, that's just not possible. Not possible, not because we couldn't return to a schedule that was familiar and the habit of your past. It's just that the reality of the things that have surfaced in your heart and your emotions as all this has erupted in the last few months is a kind of reaction to this world that should be resident and permanent in your heart. In other words, you ought to recognize how different, radically different, and I mean for fear of offending you, how abnormal you are when it comes to this world. You don't fit here. Now, if you're a non-Christian, I'm not talking to you, but I'm talking to you that really have said that you've trusted in Christ, you put your confidence in Him, that He has invaded your life, the Spirit of God has come into you, that you are a Christian now, and that you confess with the early church, which was a political statement, to say, Jesus is Lord. If that's you, if that's happened to you, life will never be the same. This world, you'll always be at odds with. You'll sense that. You'll feel that. And we ought to get used to it. I mean, as odd as it sounds, and some of the things that I'm going to say here from this text of Scripture in Hebrews 11 may seem negative, but they're not negative at all. As a matter of fact, the comparison, the juxtaposition of the positive statements and the negative statements in this passage help me to realize it's the negative part we Christians aren't good at getting comfortable with. To get comfortable with the fact that you're not going to feel normal here. That it's never going to be the way you want it to be. That it's never going to feel like this is it. Finally, it's the way it should be. It's not going to be that way. Matter of fact, that's the definition of sin. The way that things should not be. And that's going to be between now and the time that Christ is dispatched to take his great power and begin to reign. You may say he reigns in your life. You may say, hey, in my family, like we're all saved. He reigns in our home. But... You're never going to feel at home here. I mean, you just won't. Unless, of course, this is just a cultural thing and you just kind of come in every now and then with a Christian meeting or a Christian verse or a Christian concept and then you get back to being who you really are. If you're really a Christian, a child of the king, you are never going to fit in here. And I think all the unrest and uncertainty, all the medical stuff, all the chaos in the streets, all of that just reminds you that this is not your home. And that ought to be there when everything's just going along like it always is, if it ever gets back to that. So grab your Bibles and let me reassure you with this, because this shouldn't be depressing news. This should be a reassuring news, encouraging news. It ought to hearten you. And I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11, if you're not already there, and I want to look at, at just three verses, 13, 14, 15, let's go four. 13, 14, 15, and 16. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, that speaks about, and we're going to have to look at some context here of who the pronouns are referring to. It speaks about the patriarchs in the book of Genesis in particular and helps us to remember that what was true of them is true of us. Abraham lived 4,000 years ago and he has the same problem with his world that we have with ours and it's been that way for every intervening generation and it will be for every generation that comes after us if they are genuinely followers of the God of the Bible. Let me read verse 13 for you, where it says, these all died in faith. Again, we'll define that pronoun here in the context in a minute. Not having received the things promised. And that's when you go, oh, that's no good. I'm, I'm sad about that. Well, it is a sad thing because the things that God said would happen to them did not happen to them. Because God is a liar, right? No, that's not, not the reason. Because God's promises have a longer shelf life than we think. We want it now. We'd like to have it here. We'd like it to happen this month, this year, in my lifetime. And that's not the way the promises of God work. Matter of fact, most of the promises of God are not about the here and now. They are about the then and there. And that is where our heart should be. 
And even though that's a negative statement, look, they didn't receive what they promised. That should be a sad life. It says they had something internal going on that's very positive. Look at this. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, well, the them, you don't see a promise. But if it's that sense of perception, it was palpable in their minds. They said, God made a promise about something in my future, and I believe it. I'm firm on it. God is not a liar. He's proved to be faithful. That's a good thing. I greeted them. I welcomed them. I, I, I made them my friends. They were like the promises of God about the future. I, I know they're not here in a temporal sense in terms of time, and they're not here in a spatial sense in terms of right now, right here in this place, but they're coming. And it will be brought near. Having acknowledged, now here's the present mindset as they don't get what is promised in their lifetime. Having acknowledged that they were, two words, strangers and exiles on the earth. Strangers. You don't fit. It's an odd, you know, which one does not belong? This one, the Christian, does not belong. The stranger. And an exile, what does that mean? That means you got somewhere else you belong to and you're going there. You're in exile and you're heading back to where you belong. That's the picture. And if you're taking notes, and I wish that you would, haven't heard that line for a while from me, had you? Jot this one down. Number one, verse 13, don't expect to feel at home. Just don't. Don't expect to feel at home. Do not expect to feel at home. This world is not your home. And I think in the last three months, it's been easier for you to say that, right? I don't fit here. As Lewis said, C.S. Lewis said, that everything in this world, all that it has to offer, it, it basically falls short of the kinds of things that in my heart I know I am designed to want. This world is never going to do it for you. And as the ship, as I like to say, is listing and about to go down that we're on, and everyone's running around to try and readjust and straighten the deck chairs on this sinking ship, it's easy for us to fall into that. I mean, that's why we produced 460 videos for you to try and keep you centered on here's the truth because I know you're getting bombarded with, you know, thousands of videos from the news services and the blogs and even the Christian organizations telling you, look, let's straighten up the, the chairs on the deck of this ship. And I've been trying to say to you in the last three months, aim higher. There's something much bigger than that. Christian denominations, Christian churches, Christian organizations, Christian blogs, many of them so focused on what everyone else is focused on because to them, that's what matters. If we can just get that right, then we'd have it the way it should be and then we can have a real Christian society here. Not gonna work. Not going to work. Subsequent generations from Abraham have worked at trying to make this world their home and not see themselves as exiles and strangers and unfortunately, that's always a losing proposition. Not gonna work. And it's good for us just to be comfortable with that. We are not going to fix this world the way that the world wants to fix the world. It can't happen. We are strangers, don't fit, and exiles. We're going somewhere else. We don't belong here. And, and let me be, as long as I'm already disappointing you with this message, let me, let me take it another step. The world right now, in the midst of all that's happening in the streets, they want to get us to see that we're all just one Right? We're all citizens of the planet. We're all one. And, and, and it would be great for us not to think in terms of us and them. But I want to remind you that that's exactly how we should think. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has nothing to do with nationality. It has nothing to do with what they are all concerned about. It has to do with the fact that there are children of God who are citizens of a kingdom, who have a citizenship somewhere else. They are expats of a whole other place. And then there are people that are at home here. There are people where this world is their home. Matter of fact, this world is all the heaven they'll ever experience, and this is their life, and they better make the best of it as the deck lists, and they're working to try and make sure they can keep their lemonade on the table. That's the only world they have, because the next world for them will be nothing of a world. It'll be nothing but the kind of reality that Jesus spoke to all the time of outer darkness, where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Those are the, that's the truth of the gospel. Plenty of people can find a, a church where a guy can get up and open a Bible and talk about, hey, let's try and use these biblical verses to try and make the world better. Let's help them rearrange the furniture on the deck. And I'm just saying, we've got to think differently than that. We have to be committed to the reality of what it is to be Christians to say we don't belong here. 
Now, am I trying to thumb my nose at the world? No, I, I, I want to be a nice guy. I, I'd like to, if I see someone trip on the deck and they're, they've fallen over, I'd like to help them back up, put them on their chair. All of that, that's good. Be a good citizen. But just realize this, you don't belong to this world and you never had. And here's one reason why it's us and them. Not only because Jesus said it was, but because this world is under the domination and leadership of someone who is antithetical to the God that you worship this morning. Absolutely antithetical to that God. Matter of fact, when Jesus was tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and Satan came to him and said this outlandish statement, if you'd bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. You might be thinking, when you did that, how in the world do you think that you possibly could give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? What is implicit in that offer? Implicit in the offer is you must have control of the kingdoms of the world. Here he is saying, hey, just be a vassal of me. Just be a a co-regent of mine and I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. How do you think you can get off being the guy who can offer the kingdoms of the world to someone? Because as Jesus made clear in John 12, 31, he is the king of this world. Jesus calls him the arche, the ruler of the world. He is the one in charge of the world. Now, Satan, by the way, does not like you, right? He's fine with his own. I mean, he still comes to kill, steal, and destroy and causes chaos in the streets. That's the enemy that runs this world. And any chance to erupt with that kind of rebellion, he's going to make sure that his kids do that. And I mean that as clearly as I said it, because that's exactly what 1 John 5, 18 says. You have children of God and you have children of the devil. That's what Jesus said in John 6. It couldn't be clear in the Bible. We don't like to think that way, but it's us and them. That's what it is. And it will always be us and them. Those that belong to another kingdom, that hail another king, that say Jesus is king, he's Lord, and those that fit in here. And all I'm saying is that difference between who we are and who they are is so clear because the enemy runs this world. Paul came along and said in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world blinds the eyes of the unbelieving. The God of it. He enlists this Greek word theos. Theos is the word for God. He says the God, the theos of this cosmos, of this world. That's an amazing statement that Satan, think about that, is the God of this world. He's orchestrating it. He's organizing it. He is at work now as the spirit within the sons of disobedience. Paul said to the Corinthians, you know, hey, you may be living there in Corinth, which is the crossroads of the ancient marketplace world. There's all kinds, I've said many times, it's the orange county of the ancient world. And in that he says, you know what, but you have not received the spirit of the world. I came to you and preached the gospel. You received the spirit of God. They've got a whole different spirit than you. Now, in a culture that never wants to have you sitting in a place where a guy stands up behind a lectern and says, it's us and them, I'm telling you, it is us and them. Well, let's fight. Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight. We have weapons of warfare, but it's not weapons that the world has. The Bible's very clear. Our weapons are are philosophy and argument. We're destroying and demolishing, de- demolishing these, these concepts and these thoughts that are raised up against the knowledge of God. That, that's our job. See, when someone trips on the deck of the ship and they're there and I'm helping them up, I also want to remind them, listen, what, what matters is that you see that this world is sinking. I want you to get in this lifeboat with me so that we can sail across the turbulent waters and get to the kingdom. So this is my whole purpose. That's aiming higher, and I cannot believe how quickly Christians are losing that perspective. And that's why when I had a chance to look you eye to eye, I wanted to say, here's the message we need to preach. You are strangers and aliens, exiles, passing through. Now, that really is about Abraham, right? Look at verse 8. That's who we're talking about. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. And we have to work really hard to figure out just the basics of what God is going to do in the kingdom, right? We, we, we write books and we do our best trying to figure out what's it going to be like. And at least we can dismiss the thoughts of the cotton ball clouds and the see-through bodies and harps on, you know, whatever. All that stuff, that's not it. We, we get at least a semi-picture of it. But just like Abraham, we don't have even a clear picture of where we're going. But we trust Verse 9, by faith he went to live in the land of promise. You think, well, he got there. No, he didn't get it because he was a foreigner there. He lived as a foreigner, living in tents with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, who were also heirs with him of the same promise, and that is I've got a kingdom that's coming for you. Do you know that the piece of real estate that was promised to Abraham 
the only piece of it that Abraham ever owned was the one plot of land that he was buried in? That's it. The rest of the time, he's intense. No one handed him the keys to the Ferrari and the mansion and said, here you go. Welcome to the promised land. They said, nope, you're an alien here. You don't have rights here. You're going to come in and you just, you don't fit in with us. And you know the story of Abraham and Sarah and all that they went through. I mean, they were not accepted. They had to run into places like Egypt and then back into the land of Canaan. And they struggled through this life. And yet, in their heart was something that moved beyond the promised land of the physical dirt that was under their feet as they walked around in that piece of real estate. They were looking, look at verse 10, forward to the city that has foundations. No city has foundations. Not in the absolute sense, right? No city out there is going to last forever. But there is a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Not Abraham's servants, not Abraham and his architects. The designer and builder is God. He's looking for something beyond this life. Now, verses 11 and 12 remind us that, yeah, Sarah was promised a baby and they did get that baby, but that baby was just the beginning of a promise, which wasn't really about lives that would end up dying in 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. It was about having people that were made in the image of God that would put their trust in this God and look for that same city that had foundations whose designer and builder is God that will dwell in that city. Well, all these, verse 13, died in faith. They trusted in that promise, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Verse 14, you want to find yourself in this passage? Here you are, verse 14. For people who speak thus, and hopefully that includes you, Thus, what do you mean thus? That I'm an alien and a stranger here. I don't fit in this world. I've got another place that God has promised that I'm looking forward to. Well, they they make it clear by saying that they don't fit here, that they are seeking a homeland, a homeland. Interesting translation, lots of ways to translate that word, but the root of that word in Greek is the word uh, that we get the word father from, father, that our father lives there. Not just that I grew up there because Abraham grew up in Ur of the Chaldeans at the bottom of the Mesopotamian river valley and yet we know he didn't want to go back there. He left that place. God was taking him somewhere else, this place that he had to act like a, a foreigner in, but he was looking for a city that was beyond this life and if we think that we are that way now, then we seek a homeland too. What are we seeking? Same thing, verse 10, a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Verse 15, if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. A lot of double meaning in that verse. Of course, Abraham could have gone back. Matter of fact, when it was time for his son to get married so that he could marry within his clan and his tribe, he wasn't even willing to go back and find a wife for his son Isaac, and he wouldn't even let Isaac go back to his old homeland. He sent a servant there to bring someone back. And there they said, well, this is our land. I know we don't feel at home here, but one day God is going to transform this. And they knew it wasn't just in this temporal life. It was going to be in the next life. They had a picture of an eternal city. And they had to live as exiles and strangers seeking a homeland that they had not experienced. If you're taking notes and you wrote, don't expect to feel at home, I'd like you to write this next based on verses 14 and 15. You and I need to improvise and adapt without compromise. The Marines like to say that. They talk about improvising and adapting and overcoming. Christ is going to overcome for us. He's going to bring in a city for us. He's going to bring in a new world for us. Our job between here and there is to improvise and adapt. Let's let God worry about overcoming because at the end he will. Let's worry right now about not compromising. So there's my little twist on that ancient, you know, that old unofficial slogan of the Marine Corps. I want to improvise and adapt, which means this that I'm going to have to live much like Abraham lived in a place where all this culture, all this stuff is not where I feel at home, but I'm going to live here and do my best. And even when there's, a, where there's an onslaught of people coming in and doing something wrong, even Abraham, he took up arms and he went to war for a land that he didn't even own. And he, he was a good citizen. And you need to be a good citizen. You need to obey your leaders here on earth. You even need to say what Peter said. We should fear God and honor the emperor as hard as that can be when Nero is in the palace. But the reality is, my loyalty is somewhere else. I want to be a good citizen, but I want to know that 
This is not what this world is really all about. It's about the next world when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So I'm looking forward, which is what everyone had to do. Think about Moses. 500 years later, Moses comes along. Matter of fact, this, this statement of the heroes of faith goes into talk about it. He had to live in a place that he didn't belong to. Drop down to that passage in this text. It says here in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me find it with my old school paper. I haven't preached from paper in a long time. Won't this be great when I get back to electronics? Verse 24. (laughs) See, now, if I were shooting a video, I could have just edited that part out and you'd never see it. You'd be like, man, he's just got it down. He's got it wired. He knows right where it is. I've been tricking you for three months. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, okay, you can't blame him for being a little kid getting scooped out of the the river by Pharaoh's daughter. But when he grew up and he knew who he was, knew who he had descended from, knew that he was a child of the promise, just like Isaac and and just like Jacob and, and Joseph. Well, then he recognized, well, I don't belong to these people. I live among these people. I'm even wearing the garb of the Egyptians. I, I studied their books. I'm, I'm in their palaces, but I don't, I don't belong here. As a matter of fact, I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You don't have ownership on me. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God. Now, you don't like these people? Well, those are my people. And these people that were enslaved there in Egypt, he says, those are the people that I am associated with because I am the one, just like them, descendant from Abraham that are looking for a city beyond this world. So I could kind of go undercover, just like many of us are tempted to go undercover. I could kind of fit in. I could do a little Christian stuff with Christian people when no one else is looking. But instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of being in with this culture, the fleeting pleasures of fitting in with this world, the fleeting pleasures, as it says over there in James chapter 4, that you can be a friend of the world. And you know what? The friend of the world seems to get along better than someone that's going to stand up for Christ. Well, you be a friend of the world, and that is hostility or enmity toward, toward God. And he said, I'm not going to do that. I consider, and here it is, this is an anachronistic statement. I mean, this is obviously 1,400 years before Christ came, but he said, he considered the reproach of Christ, people that don't like Christ. As he says two chapters later in Hebrews 13, Christ was going to be exiled out of the city of Jerusalem. He was going to have to be killed beyond the city walls. Go out beyond the city walls. The writer of Hebrews poetically says, go stand with him because he's not accepted here. Just like Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And Moses said, I'll stand with Christ, so to speak. And I find that to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For why? He was looking just like you should be looking, just like Abraham was looking, just just like Daniel was looking when he was in Babylon, looking for the reward. Daniel could have done everything that the Babylonians asked him to do. I mean, here it was a thousand years after Moses, and Daniel was hauled off to a whole other place, Babylon, which, by the way, that is still as relevant as our lives right now. You can look it up in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 18, where it says this world system that we live in, it can be called Babylon. That's a picture of that culture that is antithetical to God. And here was Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah, they were all hauled off to Babylon along with Daniel, and they stood there having to, to put on the garb of the, of the Babylonians, having to read the books of the Babylonians, having to live among all the Babylonians. But when it came to things where they were told they cannot do these things because the law of God says you can't, then they said, I'm sorry, I can't. They resolved not to eat the king's food, wear the king's clothes, live in the king's dormitories. I can study the king's books. I can even help the kingdom. And you should be a good, be a good citizen. But when it comes to you asking me to do something that the Bible says I cannot do, then I refuse. That's exactly what Daniel did. That's exactly what, as you know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And they said, hey, king, you want us to bow down to an idol? We're told not to bow down to idols. And you know what? Our God is powerful enough, chapter 3 says, to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow down. You need that kind of resolve to not compromise. We adapt. I'm adapting right now. I'm preaching in a parking lot, right? When I got a building right there, we could be inside of. I'm going to adapt. Just like 
Daniel and his three friends, they adapted only insofar as we could. Talking to someone yesterday that said they were in the waiting room of a doctor's office. The waiting room of a doctor's office. Conversation was had about Christ. The gal that worked behind the window leaned through and said, you can't talk about that stuff here. Okay? I mean, that's the kind of world that we're moving toward. It erupts in times like this that remind us, wow, this whole world system is antithetical to what God has called us to be and do. I got to be ready to say, you know what? I can talk about this. Matter of fact, I have to talk about this. It's much like Jesus said about people not talking about it. And if you don't talk about it, the rocks are going to cry. And of course, we have to talk about it. Our job is to not compromise. And Daniel didn't compromise. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't compromise. Noah lived in a place. Think about being Noah. You live in a place that you know is doomed. All I care about is getting that ark built and seeing if I can persuade anybody else to get on it with me. Do you think Noah paid his taxes during that period? Of course he did. Did he want to? Of course he didn't. The idea of us adapting and improvising, that's where we're good citizens. As a matter of fact, jot these two references down. I don't have time to turn them to you, but if you're taking notes there somehow, jot down Jeremiah chapter 29 and Psalm 137. Jeremiah 29, Psalm 137, both of those passages, those chapters, as you skim through them, remind you that God says to people in the midst of the Babylonian captivity, hey, be faithful to me, but you know what? Look out for the welfare. The, pray for the welfare of the city. Because if things are good in the city, that's good. That's good for you. Like Paul said, just pray for your leaders. Pray that you can live a, a quiet life and you can do what God has called you to do without all this disruption. We talk about being faithful to God. I know some of the rebels among us just want to, they, they want to be rebellious. That's not our job. Our job is to be good citizens, but to recognize that when it comes to our ultimate loyalty, our loyalty is to God. And that means sometimes when you push us too far, we're not going to take that next step. I'm not going to eat your food. I'm not going to bow to your idols. I'm not going to shut up about Christ. We improvise and we adapt without compromise. We could go back. We could fit in. It's a good cross-reference for us to study, I suppose. That Revelation 18 passage. We can live in Babylon and start acting like Babylon or James 4. We can be friends with the world, but we end up being adulteresses before God. So we'd prefer rather not to go back. We want to keep looking forward. We got to live among them. I know it's an easy statement. You learned it as a new Christian, right? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That's a harder thing than you might think. It's easy to say. We're in this culture, but we're not of the culture. That's a tough thing to do. But if we do it, Let's end with this, verse 16. There's a great prize that's held out to us, verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country. I love the fact that it's they, it's in the present tense. We're not just talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking about you. We're talking about every Christian that reads this chapter and sees themselves as strangers and aliens looking for a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. Those people, they desire a better country. That is, I'm not talking about you moving up in this world, getting a better seat on the listing deck of a sinking ship. I'm talking about the country that we're going to go to once we get in that lifeboat and head across to the kingdom. If you desire that better country, that's a good thing. Therefore, if you have that desire, and I wonder how that desire is doing in your life right now. If that's true, then God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city, a city, the Bible says, that will be your homeland. Talk about the fatherland, the land of the father. It's going to come out of heaven, it says in Revelation 21, like a bride adorned for her husband. Right now, you should live in this world knowing it is not my home, but you have a city that has been prepared for you. If I go away, Jesus said, John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I'm going to receive it in myself that where I am, you may be also. That context of a hope of an eternal home ought to be the desire of your heart and mine. And if so, then God's not ashamed. As a matter of fact, you can flip that over. That makes God proud. Jot that down if you're taking notes. Number three, we need to make our king proud. When you said Jesus is Lord, you became a Christian and you said that, Let's make the king that you say is the Lord, let's make him proud that we are caring more about his country and his kingdom and that new land, that better land, that that's our consuming passion. That will make him proud. And it's something that we need to think more often about, we need to pray more about. 
We make him proud by loving this coming kingdom. Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, the last chapter that we have, the last extant letter from Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I know there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that just envelops the whole thing. Everything God's going to do, a righteous place, as 2 Peter says, chapter 3, a, a, a world, a land, a place where righteousness dwells. He says, he's laid that up for me, but not only for me, listen to this, but for all who have loved his appearing. If I were to ask you how your desire is going, how your love is going, you need to think about, do I love that world? Do I love that coming promise? That's how the Bible ends, right? Last section of the last chapter of the Bible. He who testifies to these things says, here's John, surely I'm coming soon. He's quoting Christ now. And he says, amen, come Lord Jesus. Christ promised to come. Our job is to make him proud. And just like, think about it, 500 years after Abraham, the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, we can safely assume, speaking in the burning bush, first person for God, when Moses said, who is this that I'm talking to on this line? The angel of the Lord said, I am the God of Abraham. What an honor that must be. Think about that. I mean, 500 years later, think about how proud God is of the imperfect, sinful, frail, man of feet of clay kind of man like Abraham. He's still proud of him because, as this text says, he cared about the next life more than he cared about this one. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wonder if 500 years from now, God would introduce himself to someone saying, I'm the God of Jim, of Linda, of Tom, of Sally. I mean, that's huge. I want to be associated with that. I'm proud to be their God. Eli was doing a really bad job honoring God. The man of God came, the unnamed man of God, and said to him, listen, you need to remember, and he speaks in the first person for God here, the prophet, he says, those who honor me, I will honor. Did not Jesus say the same kind of thing? He says, if you're ashamed of me, he inverts it, I'm going to be ashamed of you. If you can live right now as though this world is not your home, that you know you're a stranger and an exile, that your job is to do whatever it takes in this weird kind of obstacle course called a fallen world and tiptoe through it and move through it and slither through it over here and stand up and crawl over that obstacle and say, I'm going to try to do what I can do. Hang my harp on the willow branch and wish I were in Jerusalem. Pray for the welfare of the city, but not be compromising about seeking and pursuing and declaring this kingdom to my generation. And the Bible says that Christ will not be ashamed. God will honor us. You ever been embarrassed about your parents? Maybe as a seventh grader when you asked them to drop you off around the corner of the school? And I'm sure that sometimes your parents might have been embarrassed about you when they were called into the principal's office because you were not a good student that week. I mean, I just want the inverse of that. I want to be proud of our dad, and I want dad to be proud of us, right? I want God to look at us and go, there's a church in the midst of a lot of chaos that can't wait to be home. I am proud to be called their God. In Isaiah 28, God is revealing all these great things about the coming kingdom, and he talks about the remnant of the people. And he says to the remnant of the people, those people that get it right, even though everyone else is getting it wrong, they trust in me, they believe my promises. He says, to them, I will be a crown of beauty. I will be a crown of, of, of glory. I will be a diadem to them. You know what that means? Like, I'll be this studded, jeweled crown. I will be the great thing for them. I'll be their, their glory. By chapter 62 in Isaiah, God himself inverts that picture. And he says, my people, they'll be a crown of beauty to me. My people, right, they're going to be a diadem in my hand. I mean, that's the kind of love relation with God you want, right? God is proud of us. We're proud of him. God sees us as, as, as his beauty, and we see him as the beauty that we can't wait to encounter face to face. We serve Christ now, and we sacrifice for him. Jesus gave a parable, and he said, one day I'm going to gird myself to serve you. I'm going to make you recline at the table and I'm going to wait on you. 
I mean, if there's any promise that should just jump off the page at you, it's this. These people desire a better country, a heavenly country, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. And by the way, this is not just empty wishing upon a star. He has prepared a city for them. Let's make that our desire this week. Let's pray. God, help us please in the midst of a chaotic and crazy world that reminds us, and I hope it reminds us every day, that we do not belong here. As distasteful as it may be to those listening in that don't understand what it is to be regenerate and born again, we have to think that it's us and them. And the care we have for them, we do want welfare in the city. We'd like there not to be chaos in the streets. We don't want craziness in any part of this country or this world. But God, we know this. This is not the world we live for. This is not the world we hope in. This is not the world that we ever think can be corrected by rearranging the furniture on the deck of a sinking ship. We know that our only real lasting mission is to get as many people as possible on those lifeboats so that we can start this journey of discipleship to arrive on the shores of the kingdom. So that you can say to us as we approach that, as the promises are greeted, even as we get in that lifeboat, as we launch toward the kingdom, to be able to recognize that you will say to us one day when we see you face to face, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Thanks that you've prepared a city for those of us that sit among this crowd right now that have put their trust and hope and confidence in you. God, make that palpable, make it real in our lives this week. May it affect our priorities, our conversation, and everything about us as Christians, in Jesus' name, amen.